The Considered Life by Stefan Bublil Chapter 4 Religion Of the multitude of reasons, be they insulting or reasonable, that makes one person follow another's version of the unknowable, I believe I can be of service and sum up succinctly the main dilemma of the forever-year-old phenomenon, men with beards. Why indeed do we always choose them to lead us into the invisible for no better reason than he with the highest post in the land gets to draw God? That's right, I'm looking at you, Constantine. So many women and children, not to mention merely mustachioed gentlemen, available to dispense their version of terrestrial salvation. Yet we always veer toward the untrimmed. What is it? Perceived wisdom? Virility? The ability to still be able to taste lunch way past dinner time? I imagine that the earliest tribes of human, the very first and hairiest to populate the earth after the proverbial word, whatever their belief systems, probably could not be called religious, for the concept of a supreme being did not exist. Yet, already, a force beyond what we see, if I may borrow a term, was ostensibly responsible for darkening the skies and making rainfall. Whatever made the earth tremble, whoever made the sun return every day, was not a being per se, but there was a sense that nature was a power of some importance, since it was depicted in symbols of influence in upper Paleolithic caves and mountain faces all over France, where most earliest such documentation is found. Fast forward to a mere 28,000 years ago and the Cro-Magnon man has evolved from mere painter to a practitioner of rituals, which attempt to fill the explanatory void left by peculiar events, such as natural disasters, until then viewed as punishment from the presumed invisible. From what we know of this period, the need to appease these incomprehensible incidents with sacrifice and prayer appears to be so widespread among early Homo sapiens as to make the argument plausible that belief in an all-pervading spiritual influence might be hardwired into the human brain. Now fast forward again to ancient Egypt, where we see a multitude of gods emerge in multiple ways to worship them through daily activities, the beginning of man's long-term and far-reaching quest to do away with personal responsibility, which, as time passes, surreptitiously turns into habitual devotion. If the cause for the creation of such complex systems is fear and or ignorance, then certainly the welcome effect is not having to feel liability for any action on either side of subjective morality. Indeed, we tell ourselves, there must surely be a deity, whether conveniently invented or borrowed, that regulates my behavior. Even any thought of any behavior hence liberates me from blame. And whether Egyptian, Greek, Roman or pagan, the buffet of gods was plentiful, the choice is almost endless. Do you need to learn handicrafts in time for baby Agapios' birth? Talk to Athena. Is corn on the cob your game? Osiris will be your server today. Are you worried about your children coming back from school alone for the first time? No worries. domiduca has got their back. In fact, not only did the mostly oral traditions preordain, pre-think, and pre-sure choices, they also assigned moral value in step with your tribe's beliefs, so you could stand to bear very little responsibility for your own life. If the consequences of your actions were unfortunate, it was because you didn't pray enough, or to the right God. And surprisingly, the rules set forth often went against man's instinct and resulted in guilt, the most useful of all religious feelings, which we shall plow later, thereby ensuring further commitment, and so on, and so forth, etc., ad infinitum. Circle of life. Of course, we now understand this concept as religion, but it was not then. It was myth. From the Greeks to tribal Africans to modern man, we have surrounded ourselves with folklore, something I have no problem with. But such philosophy has also surrendered to a traditional form of insanity, or an insane form of traditionalism, I'm not sure which, that forces us to sign its ridiculously pro-owner lease and obey the bylaws to the letter before we can even peek at the lobby. And I have a big problem with that. How did most of us fall for this? How did civilizations amazingly end up with patently similar creation and end-of-time myths? 
Is it a coincidence that most of their, and consequently our gods, look down on us? Further establishing the prerequisite that these are nanny deities who make sure we are well taken care of, have enough books, commandments, rules, so that we may not fail to understand their plans for us, and more to the point, our own limits? Pre-Christian Gnostics posited that what we see is not actually what is, that in fact, the crude shell we inhabit is the loser's prize, that we are incapable of grasping truth with a capital T because we have been sent to live in a lamentable facsimile. The reason for such defeatist theism, which most religions naturally tend toward, lies in religions ready to wear belief in the incontrovertibility of God's hierarchical superiority, in both wisdom and geography, a notion that prevents a life individually considered. Few of them, if any, place the divine within us. It is almost always external, and not just external, but higher ranking. Even in the most basic tribal myth, humans always make offerings to the gods, who are invariably worthier than us. Whether we burn an animal, look in the entrails of a chicken, or offer up a virgin, the reach is consistently outward. All we need to attain salvation, it seems, is a way to connect with them, a way to signal our presence. And different civilizations have different ways of signaling. But one constant remains through all belief systems, the wonderful stories. For as soon as there were cave dwellers, there were cave drawings. And as soon as there were cave drawings, there were storytellers who became myth makers, who spoke of the gods judging us and deciding we could not be left alone. That is when the myth makers discovered their power, when they understood that they could influence, guide, and have authority over others as they told those amazing stories, especially if they involved aspects supernatural, aspects that could not be satisfyingly explained for they had no documented context, but most importantly could not be proven wrong by empirical study. The Greeks believed their dreams to have been transmitted during the night by the gods telling them what to do. The Romans had the demiurge, a very, very tall man, who could actually reach into the heavens, talk to the gods, and relay their messages back down to mere mortals. We have Pat Robertson. Granted, a diminished source of wisdom, but still, all in all, a myth-maker in his own right. All of them, not merely content with transmission, but requiring obedience without investigation. What once was wonder turned into indispensable certainty in one or another story, and the exclusion of other stories to the detriment of peace. That was the beginning of faith. Could the motivation for such an unreasonable approach be the simple, base, human need for control? I think so. Control over ourselves, over our own fears, certainly. But then still, our lies are just too damn hard, aren't they? It was too hard then, and it is too hard now not to have a safety net. And religion, as it eventually became known, is quick to provide one, which it does elegantly because it is so rich with stories, so rich with characters, so rich with lessons, with morality, with not-so-white lies. Religion tries to do what art had done before it, to rationalize what Keats romantically called negative capability, the wish to find a way for us to live with the unexplainable. Art does so much, with so much more humility, as it attempts with mere interpretation of the world to show us that which cannot be shown, daring us to look beyond form. Art shows us that there are parts of this world we cannot see, but it does so without vanity because it dares not name that which it cannot know. It dares not draw its face. The very opposite of the religious approach on the whole. So what do we do? Well, we follow. We have followed. We do what we're told, as always, whether it be in matters of religion, matters of family, or matters of war. We follow. But as with all things we blindly espouse, immense danger looms. For any and everything can be asked of followers when done in the name of the all-knowing. Arguably, a non-existent threat when one admits to know little and reconsiders life from scratch. How convenient it is to take away from oneself one's responsibilities, one's possibilities, one's opportunities, one's own divinity, and decree that judgment cannot be rendered here on earth, but in a place we cannot go to while alive, a place that we cannot see, smell, hear, or feel, this purported kingdom of God. But we are told it is real. 
not only described as a place, almost Google mappable, but also structured in a specific way with specific rules, which, if disobeyed, will incur the wrath of its landlord, the supreme being, who reserves the right, naturally, to deny us entrance into his place of business. God is apparently not above the, no doubt, quintessentially divine principle of no shoes, no shirt, no service. Sublime in its efficiency, it all started with a bunch of well-meaning stories. It all started with an ambitious storyteller. The problem, much like the game of telephone, is that these stories get warped every time they're retold to another generation. And what was once a beautiful tale, perhaps even partly an eyewitness account of a philosopher farmer, one among many such wise men in Galilee around 10 before the common era, who did little more than speak his version of the truth slowly, becomes entirely wishful fiction, which in turn becomes fantasy, where we are today. And a lot of us account for our lives based on such tales. There is no reason to denigrate Christianity, Islam, or Judaism any less than we denigrate Scientology or far-flung cults of the imagination, for they are all based on rules arbitrarily adjudicated. This is in contrast to Eastern religions, that seek to further man's ability to cope with his own life based on the fundamental nature of his existence, the very definition of an entirely different approach called philosophy, which questions instead of answering, the reason I don't pack them in the same bag. Live and let live, right? Right. That is always my point, which is why I always get the most vehement when religion is taught to children because I cannot stand that the innocent are not given a choice to believe in deities they find best represents them, not given an opportunity to learn about the wide variety of understandings of the unknown and invisible before they choose a way, whatever that way might be. Even though I have chosen atheism as the way that best represents my worldview at this time, I do not advocate atheism. I advocate pluralism. I advocate search. That is the only path at the end of which, when presented with a fork in the road, somebody can finally consider their life and truly make a choice. The problem is that we have given up searching in favor of finding. So what are we to do? Well, it is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma because although I have removed myself from the affairs of God, I will sincerely tell you that my disbelief in the supreme being does in no way devalue my awe at humanity's capacity for faith. Awe and admiration. Absolute admiration. I'm not kidding. It is even hard for me to adequately write about how filled with wonder I am by true believers. Hard for me to talk about the admiration I have for people who think of Jesus not as a man, Beyond even a god, but as they put it, the way. For fear that you may believe me snarky, I assure you, I am not. Whether it is expressed through speech or song, religious fervor is something that is, to me, at once mystifying, yes, scary, sure, but also worthy of esteem. Mystifying because it is very hard to understand why somebody would put so much credence in something that cannot be empirically experienced other than during self-induced hallucination. How indeed could anyone use handed down texts that are verifiably fictitious, contradicting versions coexisting across space and time as one example, and yet still apply their precepts to everyday life, refusing examination? It is scary because this very unwillingness to doubt is what compels some to strap on explosives and board a crowded bus in the name of Allah, kill dutiful doctors in the name of Christ, or deny Palestinian state rights in the name of Balfour. But it is absolutely worthy of esteem, because such inconceivable willingness to lay one's life down for such belief is, in this day and age, of lazy cowardice, a feat rarely managed for much of anything by anyone. I do not know a lot of hedge fund managers or graphic designers willing to give their lives for their craft, and perhaps I know the wrong people, but I would bet a case of Croze Hermitage that their number is dwarfed by those who have died in the pursuit of heaven. And it is all the more worthy of admiration that, especially seen from the cheap seats of disbelief, and even when contradicted by facts and vocal critics, either sub-denominational or on the outside, dogma resists new quests for knowledge in order to keep relative peace within, willing to discard odds in favor of confidence in an arbitrary canon which must be kept indisputable. In comparison to such lofty aspiration, truth, 
is an understandably distant concern. We are a species comfortable within the pre-calculated limits of our belief systems, for which we seldom deviate, even if new evidence is presented. That is because the truth does not stand a chance against faith. It is not meant to, or so it has been explained to us. But there is something else. There is another concept that holds religions and faith's hands. The third leg of this precarious stool on which we seemingly balance ourselves in a feat of acrobatics worthy of a Canadian circus. And that is tradition. When the other two fail, if you are no longer willing to take the rules of God on faith, if you doubt God's reasons for ordering you to kill, if you ever wondered what the Supreme Being wanted with your foreskin, if you question how forgiveness can be implemented through repetition of Hail Marys, if you ever contemplated, God forbid, abandoning the ancestral teachings, then tradition will usually hold steadfast. We simply cannot overestimate the power of habit in this matter. If I, as a lowly human being, have little power over myself, let alone my context, at least I have on my side the indubitable power of history. That way, if nothing else, I can rely on that which has been perpetuated through my family or by my people, whoever they might be, in order to find my way in the darkness. Rites keep tradition alive. Communions, bar mitzvahs, self-flagellation, prayer, diets, fasts, downward dogs, broken glasses, burials, lamentations, human sacrifice and Easter eggs, among others, all intend to make you believe in a better you that is unattainable without them. I think there is little difference between Dr. Atkins or Jesus, Oprah or Jiva Mukti, all distractions, all outside. Just because we have been told that modern forms of religion, such as yoga or fruit cleanses or tools for living, doesn't mean they are, just that they've been well marketed. I understand this is a matter of opinion. Mine is that once you accept that anything outside can enhance your ability to consider, everything is equal, from Zenu to Dr. Phil. For they introduce rites that allow us, so goes the loop, to keep a direct connection to our past, to ancestors who performed the same gestures, thought the same things, said the same words, perhaps with less, perhaps with more fervor, but linked nonetheless through gestural and oral traditions. That too is religion. That said, religion is, I discovered for myself, also a blindfold to the possibilities of who you could be something I did not understand until I went to my half-brother's bar mitzvah. As reasonably tolerant as I try to be with people who choose to believe, I am actually quite confrontational about my own family, who have decided to renew their practice of Judaism later in life, when it was, in my youth, utterly absent. With the befuddlement I feel surrounding the decision to start anew with any religion in the middle of one's life, I question the very real consequences of Hebrew lessons and bar mitzvahs and Shabbats for children. The intent and effect of religion, designed to be specifically exclusionary, it seems to me a psychological offense to introduce such a concept to evolving life forms and not expose them to all available paths, not to open their minds but close them, not to familiarize them with the most but the least. Why can we not practice two religions at once, in the same way we allow dual citizenship or multilingualism? Could I not be, if I so desired, Judeo-Christian? And why the hell not? But as I stepped foot in my brother's Jewish celebration of nascent manhood, surrounded by family, guests, and rabbis, to which I felt little connection, I realized that there must be another element here, other than faith, religion, and tradition, because I felt something. Community, the unbeknownst to me fourth leg of its increasingly steady stool. And there is something about community that is appealing, because it brings people together if for no other reason than to be there, side by side. Now, is it under false pretenses? I believe so. Is it under dangerous pretenses? I believe so as well. But the fact is, nobody died. Sure, some people were bitter. I was one of them. But we had been brought together in one place. Often the winning argument I hear from friends who go to church or temple casually an approach I abhor for it lacks design and therefore meaning, and who claim that they frequent their places of worship solely for the smell of incense, which takes them back to a time when fervor was an obligation, not transformed into nostalgia. I never had much respect for that perspective, because to me the issue was always black and white. If you felt absolute religious devotion, 
Why would you need to go to a place of worship built hundreds of years ago on the broken backs of believers simply to smell something? That seems disrespectful to your church, to your God, and to yourself. But I have to admit, there is something within this idea that is, well, comfortable. And as much as I deem comfort to be an unworthy goal, when paired with religion, it betrays our peculiar need to be in the company of others like us. The need then begets the search for one's own place within that context, and that is exactly what I started wondering myself, there, in the middle of the desert. What is my place in this room with 130 people I am told I share blood with? Where do I belong? How do I belong? Have I chosen my status here, or am I merely in receipt of its luxurious support? The truth is that I chose my outcast position by default, and recognize that, perhaps, my behavior was not so productive a process, a revolutionary contrition for a hard-headed tyrant of my sort. I became aware that this community was actually an important contributor to my considered life, which felt quite powerful as it allowed me to find a place, my place, within the given context, the one that I thought left no alternatives because it was not of my choosing. Unexpectedly, the communal aspect of religion has a knack for getting people to reconsider their place in life, even if it is by exclusion. I used to have little to no regard for the value that people who saw you grow up have value for the sole reason that they were there when you did. Their act of presence cannot indeed be considered meaningful when mere consequence of lineage. I still don't. But what about the conversations, informed by their knowledge of you as a child or as a teen, passively observed or actively pursued, which are, by the very nature of the participants, at least better informed than conversations with strangers? What about the connections with other human beings versed in the history of you? Is there not, by ordinary coincidence of birth, value to be assigned to those among which you happen to grow up? They saw, they heard, they disagreed, they yelled, they cried, they were wrong, they sneered, they underestimated, they fucked up, and so did you. In short, they mattered by the very act of presence heretofore dismissed, a step of religious tradition which opens our eyes to the importance of them. Which brings me to the ultimate dichotomy about religion, a notion that it attempts to fight any time it can, that it is both good and evil. Ironically, concepts it invented but no longer supervises. Before religion, there was no need for good and evil. There were just events. If a bison bit my leg off, it was not evil, it was unfortunate. When there was a birth, it was not specifically good. It was an addition to the group. This notion of judgment on either side of the equation is what religion needs in order to control the masses, to control behavior, providing the antithesis to a life in which a person is the only judge of his or her actions. Therefore, how can religion fit within a considered life? Well, it starts with the consideration of religions as a matter of fact, with common foundations of the same few myths, mostly pagan, put together by people, for people, in order to tell compelling stories, morality plays, which became morality cults. The considered life begs you to look at each one of these dogmas and then look at your own life to bear witness to your own conclusions and act upon them. It is very easy to get emboldened by religion because it promises a lot, whether it is 72 virgins or an eternal soul. It promises a lot and it doesn't make you work very hard for it, merely asks you to say a few prayers, live by a book and get in through the gates. Consider the causes of what made you accept these concessions in the first place and see whether this is something you need, something you want, or something you are scared of doing, or rather not doing, and only then make your choice. Religion can no longer be thought of just as a set of rites and traditions. It is now a morality regulator that looks at every part of our lives and introduces that oh-so-wonderful of concepts without which we would seemingly be helpless. Guilt. The beauty of guilt in Abrahamic religions is all-powerful. It is with guilt that we are made to believe. It is with guilt that we are made to react. And it is with guilt that we are made to pursue right or wrong paths based on the word of a man slash spirit we cannot be sure exists. We must free ourselves from this cycle as a first step within a life considered in order to gain knowledge of ourselves and act on what we mean to do as opposed to simply react. 
By eliminating guilt, we gain a spine and we can go forward and conquer ourselves with the understanding that ourselves means exactly that, our selves. Religion is not the root of all evil. It is not the stairway to heaven. Most importantly, religion is not to be ignored. It cannot. It demands our attention and courage. It needs to be thought of as a part of the whole in order to make decisions that are meaningful and fulfilling, even if we ultimately reject it. Ignoring any part of life, preferring instead the inherited habits of those who came before you, means still birth to your mind, to your body, to your life. Ignorance is not bliss. It is death. For example, whether you believe that Jesus was a prophet, a simple philosopher, a farmer, or the son of God, whether he might have been a swindler, a fraud, or a charlatan, does not matter. The truth is moot except for what it represents in your life. That is the true utility of the story of Christianity. What does it mean to you? I am of the mind to consider all the stories, for they say much more about us than they say about God. I am of the mind to let curiosity guide me instead of wisdom. I am of the mind to never fear being wrong and embrace it all, because we have nothing to lose. To me, pure awe in the storytelling abilities of one Saul of Tarsus, edited by the scribes on King James's payroll to give us what some consider today, to my amazement still, to be the actual word of God. And Christianity is, of course, but one of many welcome ways to look at a world brimming with countless myths, sagas, stories, and legends that purport to explain the origins and purpose of our planet's reportedly conscious inhabitants. My questions are these. Why anthropomorphize the unknowable at all? Does it not seem silly to respond to confusion with invention? Are we so unimpressed with ourselves that we couldn't possibly be what we are looking for? Is it usually your chosen process to form mythologies around what you do not understand? If a lowly farmer, would you relegate the production of computer motherboards to the machinations of a god for the simple reason that you do not understand their manufacturing process? No, you would not. If we do not apply this principle to the mysteries of our daily life, why then apply it to existence? Believe for the love of God. Believe in yourself first.